Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Well, the Constitution should be a fundamental document that provides a process for how other laws are created. Voters weigh six amendments to the state constitution. Dicamba is another tool that we definitely need. It has its place. But it also has controversy. It fills your heart and it definitely makes you want to just keep doing it. Taking kids on their first fishing trips. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first a look at other top headlines making news across Louisiana. Outside LSU's Pete Maravich Assembly Center Tuesday night, hundreds gathered to mourn LSU basketball star Wade Sims. The 20-year-old Sims was shot to death a week ago, hours before the first official practice of what would have been his junior season. Wade's father, former Tiger Wayne Sims, spoke along with teammate and childhood friend Skylar Mays and LSU coach Will Wade. Everybody liked him. You know, anybody he came in contact with, he automatically just just loved him and loved his personality. Uh, he was just a, a blast uh, to be around at, at, at all times. So um, obviously we're all still devastated and, and, and in shock. Um, about about everything, but you know we're going to um, support support Wade's uh, family, and you know we're going to support our our guys and and slowly uh, move forward uh, move forward from this. Funeral services are Saturday, October sixth. An update to a story we told you about in August, the State Department of Education, in partnership with LSU and Louisiana State Police, has been awarded a federal grant of more than $3.6 million. It's for schools statewide to help develop and expand their emergency plans for disasters. Saints and Pelicans owner Gail Benson makes her first appearance on a list that frequently mentioned her late husband. Forbes magazine's list of America's 400 wealthiest people. She is ranked 298th and is Louisiana's only resident on the list. Her net worth of $2.8 billion, according to the magazine, ties her with Oprah Winfrey. President Donald Trump has tapped a Louisiana man to lead the U.S. Marshal Service. Donald Washington is a former U.S. attorney for the state's Western District. His nomination has to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Washington is currently a lawyer working in private practice in Lafayette. Avondale Marine LLC has bought the Avondale shipyard site in Jefferson Parish and plans to turn it into a global logistics hub. The area of redevelopment includes the site's crane, dock, and terminal assets along nearly 8,000 feet of Mississippi River frontage. The news comes after years of work to transform what was at one time the largest private employer in the state. Governor John Bell Edwards made the announcement. Just in from a trip to Los Angeles, the governor also gave an update on his push to have filmmakers work in Louisiana using our film tax credit. Edwards met with eight major film production companies and says the message from Hollywood executives is that they like doing business in Louisiana. One of the things as governor that I was trying to do was trying to get these individuals to come in and take a look at the whole state. So we know that uh, New Orleans is home to a lot of productions and, and that includes uh, St. Bernard Parish and St. Charles Parish. But we have tremendous sound stages uh, in Baton Rouge and up in Shreveport as well. We still have sets that are, have been erected around the, the state that remain up and available. So we were really pushing the whole state. Congress has approved a fix for the duplication of benefits problem that kept thousands of Louisiana homeowners from getting disaster recovery dollars after the 2016 floods. 
Congressman Garrett Graves says it's a real solution for real people victimized by their own government. The bill heads to the desk of President Trump for his signature. Also in the news this week, a major change to a proposal to build a commercial airport adjacent to Grand Isle. Advocates of the plan hope to build it on tiny Elmer's Island, a wildlife refuge and haven for migratory birds and other precious wildlife. An old existing airstrip built there in the 1950s was the catalyst, but the airport idea caused an uproar stunning conservationists and scientists. The proposed airport with a tower, terminal, and two runways would service small jets and private planes. It got the approval last month of the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. The Grand Isle Independent Levy District would serve as airport developer. At Thursday's Wildlife and Fisheries meeting, though, a reversal that had those strongly opposed to the idea relieved. A cancellation of the agreement to move forward. It was a dream that we thought maybe we could get in there. And uh, we met with the governor and, and the secretary a few months back, and it sounded like a good idea. And we told them when it comes to it, we'll make an agreement, and we did. And then we started finding out, you know, for, with the permits to make sure of everything. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, all hell broke loose. And in the meantime, you know, we, we want to be the friends of the bird people. And uh, you know, like you heard the lady, we got a bird celebration in March in Grand Isle. And Elmer's Island, I'm just trying to get the people back when they're to the fish. The mayor's push to bring tourists and those with their own planes would have used the overgrown airstrip. It predated the refuge and had not been used for decades. But the chorus of those opposed to it was overwhelming. I looked at that airstrip, it was hard like the cement, and I thought maybe there was a way that we could come back and just put a little asphalt and get a few planes to come in. Not, not to damage anything, just to work together, you know. But, uh, you know, we're going to back off, and, you know, we ain't going to give up. We'll find something somewhere maybe where we could better transport people. Might, who knows, we might better deal with the mayor of New Orleans or mayor of Baton Rouge somewhere else to get buses to come down and work something. Well, we aren't seeing the usual amount of TV ads typical of an election season. Not as many high profile races are happening in Louisiana, but voters will go to the polls next month and there are important items that you'll see on ballots. LPB's Kelly Spires is here to discuss the constitutional amendments. Kelly? That's right. They've got serious policy implications. So we sat down with Stephen Procopio with the Public Affairs Research Council, or PAR, to find out more. What is the Constitution and what could voters use to assess whether or not they want to add something to that document? Well, the Constitution should be a fundamental document that provides a process for how other laws are created. Over time, Louisiana has really added a lot of amendments to our Constitution that tend to do more policy. So since this version of the Constitution was adopted in 1974, we've had 189 amendments and most of those, uh, 95, have had dealt with Article 7, which is where most of the tax and fiscal information tend to be. The first amendment that's on the list that voters will consider, Louisiana kind of has um, a history of public officials who were involved in corruption. That's Can right. Go ahead and explain that one. So this one, in 1998, there was actually a constitutional amendment that would prevent felons from holding office uh, or seeking office for 15 years after they served their sentence. But let's just say for technical reasons, uh, that was overturned. And so this is an attempt to go back and do something similar. Oh, this would only be for five years after a felon completes their sentence. We are going to, on the state we're in, go into what the Second Amendment on the list is more in depth in a future episode. So I'd like to skip ahead to the third. Okay. And could you give me an example of when local governments w might find what's contained in this amendment useful? and? explain what it is. Sure, this amendment allows local governments to share resources. In the Constitution presently, there is a prohibition against donations. If a government, whether it's local or state, wants to donate something, they have to get back something of equal value. So you couldn't just let another local government have your bulldozer for a couple of weeks while they did something and give it back. They have to give you something. This would allow them to just share it and work out an agreement where they could share that. Uh, and I guess the idea is that if something else was needed down the road, they might share something back with you, but it wouldn't require a specific uh, value return on the sharing. The fourth 
uh, amendment on the list. The state's pool of money for transportation projects right. hasn't necessarily strictly been used for construction over the years. And I guess uh, there's been a lot of conversation about that in the legislature, and this is a aim to fix that. That's right. Your gas tax dollars go into something known as the Transportation Trust Fund. One of the uses that's used is for the state police for traffic control. This would remove that as an allowable use. So only things like infrastructure uh, or maintenance are uh, what could be left. That would mean that there'd be less dollars going to state police, but there'd be more dollars available for road improvement and maintenance. The final two amendments um, both have to do with taxing property. So there's, there's a lot of property um, contained in the Constitution. Uh, so anytime you want to change anything with property tax, you have to have a constitutional amendment. So number five has to do with special trusts. Um, for various reasons, people will put their property into a trust. Uh, they want to make sure it goes to their grandkids or they want to avoid probate court. There's a lot of special exemptions and special treatment for people in the Constitution. Uh, all of us get a homestead exemption, but in addition, if you're over 65, you get certain treatment. If you're a veteran, you get certain treatment. If you're disabled, you get different treatment. Uh, if you're a spouse of someone who died in the line of duty, uh, if you're a police officer, you get another special treatment. All that applies, but it doesn't apply to people who put their homes in trust. So essentially they would lose that special treatment uh, and this amendment would allow them to continue to have those things. I will say this doesn't apply to the homestead exemption. If Homestead exemption only applies if you put your property in trust. So they're already covered. This would just be all the other special uh, treatments that are out there. Now the final amendment in front of voters um, has to do with if your property is assessed at a higher value kind of all of a sudden. Right, if you have an assessment that goes up by more than 50%, this constitutional amendment would allow you to phase in how much you have to pay on your taxes over four years. So you would pay 25% of that increase uh, additionally each year. So over four years, that adds up to 100%. What is it like in other states? Are, are these kind of tax intricacies included in the Constitution or are they somewhere in statute? Usually you're gonna find them in statute. I mean, we have a lot of information, particularly about our property tax. Uh, the constitutions vary. So we have the fourth longest constitution in the United States. But there are people that have longer constitutions, including Alabama, which is something like five times as long as ours. So there are people that have, have it worse, but most constitutions uh, are much shorter than ours. What's the consequence of having this language contained in the Constitution? Well, at a minimum, that means anytime you want to make any kind of minor change, such as allowing spouses of veterans uh, to have a special exemption, you got to come back and have a vote of the people. So it has to go back a lot. and you, That's why we have a lot of amendments over time. Like every year we have several just because you can't change it any other way. It's not saying that these are necessarily bad ideas. It just means you're going to have to ask a lot of the voters. Thank you so much, Stephen. Oh, enjoyed it. Thank you. For more information, you can find PAR's amendment guide on their website. That's parlouisiana.org. And the deadline to register to vote is October 16th. You can do so at govote.com. That's G-E-A-U-X vote.com. You can see a sample ballot and find your voting location there as well. The world's largest seed and ag chemical company, Monsanto, which has a major presence in Louisiana, finds itself under a microscope. It's all because of a weed killer, dicamba. It's killing more than just weeds. Monsanto is banking on dicamba and the seeds engineered to resist it to dominate soybean production in the U.S. But alarms sounded in 25 states, especially Arkansas, Missouri, and Illinois, when farmers say it drifted off fields where it was sprayed, landing on farms planted with conventional soybeans, which are not dicamba resistant. In Louisiana, complaints have been minimal. Ted Glazer farms thousands of acres near Fort Doge in Point Capie Parish. His land stretches on both sides of the Morganza spillway almost as far as the eye can see. Dicamba is another tool that we definitely need. It has its place. Uh, you have to follow uh, the regs on it, uh, you know, when to put it out. Public thinks, and, and you know, we have farmers think that, you know, if one ounce is going to, uh, an acre is going to kill it, two is going to be better. That's not the way it works. Uh, 
you're asking for trouble down the road. Ag Commissioner Mike Strain weighed in on the dicamba controversy. Well, there were a significant number of complaints, predominantly in about a six or eight county area involving Arkansas and Missouri, more than 600 complaints in a very small area. And that really started the conversation of what was going on. There was a lot of drift problems. But when you, when you round that out, there were a number of factors that, that really resulted in those drift complaints. The EPA says dicamba damaged more than 3.6 million acres across the U.S., or about 4% of the soybeans planted in 2017. Like Glazer, strain points to how the product is used. There was probably some product that was used improperly. There was probably some product that was not the, quote, patent products that we have here. In other words, they would have used generics and mixed those together. There was improper application. There was also weather events that resulted in what we call inversion. And what inversion is, if you've ever been on the interstate going up, say, I-49 right at dawn, and you see the moisture rising up from the land and moving, that's what's called inversion. Mm -hmm. And so some of the product, uh, due to the weather conditions, actually came off the ground and moved. He believes a combination of those factors created the drift that led to the damage and the many hundreds of complaints. Even though he says complaints were few from our state, he still assembled a task force to set new guidelines. We don't use as much of these products in the state as they do in other states. And part of the, the, the work we're doing and working with the companies that produce them, and the companies will tell you, and the salesmen will tell you, don't use this product unless you need it. And so, you know, we're not just blanketly spraying with these products, these next generation products, use the least amount of chemical and the least, the, the weakest formulation you can use to achieve your end goal. When you see headlines like crops in 25 states damaged by this weed killer and they're talking about dicamba, your thoughts on that? It's scary to the point of all the publicity is getting, is getting negative publicity. You don't ever hear anything positive about it. Uh, I'm not gonna say the, uh, it's all the farmers at fault. It's, it's, it's going to be a whole combination of, of, you know, the conditions when you spray, or what happens after you spray. You know, with the economics the way it is now, the farmer's going to try the, the uh, cheapest way out sometime. And when you do that, come back and bite you. You can have trouble. You got to plan where you're going to put it, which, where's your weed problem at, what is your weed problem? Uh, and then you have to get your crops, uh, your varieties in that order. And as you said, you have to follow the directions oh, to yeah, the letter. Uh, you know, yeah, that's exactly. Uh, and I have to give it to the Louisiana Department of Ag that they on top of it. You better follow it. I have my crops that, that's tolerant to dicamba, and, and I have crops that's not tolerant. The non-tolerant dicamba is no way around. They, they 15 miles down the road. It's very important to know that we have to have all of these chemicals and all these things to be able to produce the crops that we have. Our goal is to use uh, the least amount possible to fight, you know, the to still get the, weeds, the job done. Still get the job done. But we're also looking at new other alternative methods, you know, such as we talked about as the new type of cotton plants that use a different type of phosphorus and fertilizer. You know, and looking at things that are naturally in plants. So there's so many things in the genetics of those plants that can help them to naturally fight plant pests and diseases. And so we're looking at that and all of this works together, you know, through science. What is also big news now is the storage of soybeans, places for farmers to store their harvest. Congressman Ralph Abraham joins us because you've reached out to U.S. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue. Let me ask you this, is the storage issue, which is impacted by the trade problems with China, the beginning of a larger issue? Actually, it is. Here in the South, of course, we harvest earlier than the rest of the country. We've got still about 350,000, I mean, uh, acres of soybeans to harvest in Louisiana, but also we've got 18 million acres to harvest throughout the United States. And with these beans coming now down the Mississippi River instead of going to the West Coast, this is a, a storm that is brewing. It's here for Louisiana, but it's a big, uh, it's going to be a big crisis in a few days. So what suggestions have you made to the secretary? 
look, we've got uh, talking to farmers from Avoles Parish to East Carroll Parish, and we've come up with a few suggestions. I guess the most prominent two are one, on the MFP program, let's pay for planted acres instead of harvested acres. And if we can incentivize some of our private farmers that have open grain bins available now to house some of these damaged beans, let's do it. So you've suggested that. What kind of feedback are you getting? Well, they're talking about it. Uh, and the good news is they've got to talk very quickly because we've only got here in Louisiana you know, maybe maybe three weeks, less than two weeks would be the optimum to get these beans out. We know we've got weather coming. It's getting, turning into fall right here in Louisiana, and we're mudding out the beans now, and we're going to get to the point where we can't get them out at all. All right, time is of the essence. Congressman, we thank you for your time right now on this topic. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you. We are known up and down the state as the sportsman's paradise, but not everyone has the access or the know-how to hunt or fish. Wish to Fish Louisiana is a nonprofit that puts together fishing trips for disadvantaged or disabled children. Kelly accompanied volunteers on a trip last month and brings back this story. Kelly. That's right, Danica Williams is a Department of Wildlife and Fisheries employee who started Wish to Fish. Her coworkers lead science lessons after the morning on the water, so it's not just about having fun. These kids are learning a lot. This group of kids is from an organization called Son of a Saint. See that horn on his head? See that? That's how he defends himself. Everything that's out of here tries to eat Mr. Live Shrimp. What we're gonna do, we're gonna hook our hook right under his horn and his head. Doesn't hurt him, doesn't bother him. We're gonna throw him out, pop your cork. When that cork goes down, I want you to count to two. Because what has to happen, that trout's gonna come up and hit him and break his neck. Well, he's gotta situate him with the horns out away from his mouth to swallow him. So that's why we like to count to two. You throw it out, let it count for two, and it goes down, just start reeling, you'll catch them every time. Name is Captain Matt McCabe. I'm the owner and operator of Pro Edge Fishing Charters. Today we went speckle trout fishing. We went to Keenan out for Wish to Fish Foundation. Oh, it was hot. It was hot. It was, it was fun because it was my first time. Uh, we caught, uh, I think, five redfish and about like 42 oh, trout. He didn't come. You can come here. You can swim in here. Got him. I'm a nice white trout. You can kind of see just a little nervous water. Those pogies are just schooling around and they're following them. And uh, that's a pretty South Louisiana trout right there. That's what we came for. My name is Danica Williams and I started Wish to Fish Louisiana in 2006. And basically the idea behind it was to get kids back outside. Being a mentor is kind of uh, what we try to do is, you know, fill the gap. You know, our program focuses on fatherless boys. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring in that older, you know, male you know, role model for, for the kids and kind of, you know, show them all the things that, you know, their, their dad might have done. Take them fishing, you know, show them how to play sports, show them how to cook, how to tie a tie, how to shave, you know, all those little things to prepare these these young boys to be men. When I hope my fish, it took off. Like it, I I know, that's it. Boom. And all you hear is a drag. The whole idea is to expose the kids to as much as we can. And we we tell all of our boys the same thing. Just just try whatever whatever we're throwing at you. Just give it a try. You never know if you're gonna like it. Um, so we had a kid in the boat that was terrified of touching a shrimp. And before the end of it, he was playing with them and hooking his his, uh, his bait and stuff. So. Um, you know, they love it. They, they, they love getting out and seeing all these different things that the world has to offer. First time ever in life. And I caught, man, and they got, we got six, I mean, seven fishes. No. Wow. So, already in one day, you, you've been a better fisherman than I've been my entire life. I don't think I've ever caught a fish that big.
the biggest thing that we get back from the kids when they come back and they send a thank you letter. It's thank you so much, Captain so and so, for letting me drive your boat. Um, it's rarely ever about catching a fish. A lot of these kids have never even been on the water before. So, you know, we put these kids on the boats, and the captains are trying to catch them redfish and speckled trout, and, and the kids catch a croaker, and the captains, are, you know, they're getting, they're getting frustrated because they want to put them on the redfish and want to put them on the speckled trout, but the kids are ecstatic with a catfish, you know, a croaker. It, it just, it makes them happy. You see the smiles on these kids' faces and you see the joy and the stories that they tell and, and the big bear hugs that they give you. Um, it, it fills your heart and it definitely makes you want to just keep doing it. We kick off the, the Venetian Isles Fishing Rodeo with the Wish to Fish kids are happening on Thursday. It's a lot of fun and getting to take these guys out and spend a special day with them on the water is just, uh, it's definitely rewarding. So you've caught about five or six this morning. You enjoying this so far? Yeah. yeah, you caught a big redfish too. That's a bonus fish for this morning, so that's pretty cool. I mean, I did a project on this type of, you know, on this area. Yeah, he was telling me on the way out, he did a project on uh, wetlands. Weathering and erosion and all that, like, yeah, this, this, this used to be land and all that. What we decided was, let's try to put the educational side with it. So we have um, charter boat captains that would take them out for a few hours, yes, and then when they come back to the marina, we can teach them how to identify fish, different species. We can teach them how to pull ear bones, and that's how we identify our age fish. Um, we can teach them, we teach them how to cast, we teach them how to tie them. So it's fun and educational. No, but you did good, man. You caught a lot yeah, of fish. I know. I'm proud of you. It was a lot of fun. He know all the spots where the trout are. <laughs> really. That's my job. You know my job. That's a keeper. Yeah, that's a keeper. Keep white trout. Goes in the box. You can find more about Wish to Fish Louisiana online at wishtofish.org. The Son of a Saint organization is always looking for volunteers as well. They are at sonofasaint.org. I love that story, Kelly. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download's free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow with Kelly Spires. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.